Okay, for our last um, uh, part of this presentation, uh, we do have uh, Brian Mittman, who will be our discussant. Uh, Brian is director of the Veterans Affairs Center for Implementation Practice and Research Support, and is a senior social scientist at the uh, Veterans Administration, UCLA, and RAND Center for the study of healthcare provider behavior. His research interests include implementation science, healthcare quality improvement, and healthcare management, and he received his PhD in organizational behavior from Stanford uh, University's Graduate School of Business. Despite uh, VA's uh, encrypted USB drives that uh, often cause problems, I managed to get the slides up. So a couple disclosures. Uh, first of all, thanks to Paul Cleary for helping me transfer the slides. Um, there was a, a bit of a disagreement or difference of opinion between uh, some of the folks at NCI and Marty as to when his paper would be finished. Uh, I chose to uh, uh, listen to those who uh, told me it would be finished uh, before the conference. Um, it wasn't until yesterday that I finally uh, realized that I didn't have it and I should find out. Uh, Marty's understanding was that he was finishing after the conference. So my comments uh, build on the presentation that I received in advance, but the full paper. A uh, quick note on uh, how I went about reviewing these, but also an approach that I think would be helpful for a final review and uh, perhaps revisions of some of the other papers as well. Uh, I began by a quick review of uh, what the goals are of multi-level interventions and multi-level intervention research. Uh, but I focused uh, then on the issue of what is distinctive about MLIs versus single level approaches. And perhaps more importantly for the papers, especially these two that take existing material and adapt it to the problem of multi-level interventions, what is it that's distinctive about the world of multi-level interventions? both in terms of, of uh, intervening, as well as uh, implementing and spreading those interventions and conducting research to understand multi-level interventions. So to me, that's the key question. Uh, and therefore, the fourth point, which is, do these manuscripts uh, help us uh, in terms of our des uh, desire to design better multi-level interventions, to implement and spread them, and of course, to understand their effectiveness. Uh, and as uh, is the case with any good discussant uh, or commentator, uh, the focus is not on the uh, compliments and pointing out the good things about the papers, but identifying the gaps and, as I would prefer to think about it, uh, offering what I hope are helpful recommendations for strengthening. So beginning with uh, uh, the Charns paper in alphabetical order, uh, measures and measurement, First question, what is distinctive about uh, MLIs uh, uh, relative to measures and measurement? Uh, when we think about the endpoints of these interventions, is there anything different uh, at the end of the causal chain in the multi-level world? Probably not. So everything that we learn and we can bring in from the field of measures and measurement in the single level intervention world probably applies to us in multi-level interventions. Are there any differences when we look at each different level uh, of the process and the impacts? Possibly uh, some differences. So there may be some need for adaptation and some new development. What about the issue of uh, uh, synergistic emergent patterns and phenomena, uh, uh, interaction effects and so on? There I think the answer is very clearly probably there are many things that are likely to be different and our approach to measuring and, and measures would need to be different. And finally, causal processes and mechanisms, especially cutting across levels. This is where things do get interesting, uh, where we are likely to need significant amounts of new development. So this is a, just a way of thinking about the issues and in, in, uh, I hope uh, in the paper uh, providing some guidance to think about the problem of taking existing measures and measurement approaches and adapting them and bringing them into the multi-level world and where we need to focus our efforts. Uh, and that is on uh, uh, the, the emergent kinds of processes and phenomena and understanding how to measure uh, those processes. So what are some of the other implications of these distinctions, the differences that we see in the multi-level uh, interventions? Again, I would hope that the authors are able to provide guidance for researchers and evaluators to, uh, as uh, Marty indicated in one of the final slides, uh, uh, identify and develop a theory or a logic or program model, uh, document very clearly the causal chain, and identify and adopt measurement approaches that would document that causal chain and allow us to understand how things play out. There are many opportunities in interventional studies, RCTs, uh, uh, to, uh, for things to go wrong and understanding uh, how to measure and monitor so that we understand why the endpoint outcomes were not as we expected and what it is about the different steps of the causal chain, the different interventions at the multi multiple levels that are responsible for those uh, disappointments. Uh, that seems to be an important focus of, of measures and measurement. Uh, locating and adapting existing measures and measurement uh, approaches, uh, measures that would allow us to measure the usual context, intermediate impacts, mediators and moderators, the causal chain, 
but also perhaps most importantly in the paper, uh, ideally there would be uh, guidance in developing new measures and new measurement approaches, especially, as I said, for the emergent phenomena. To the extent that we don't know in advance what is likely to emerge, this is a bit of a challenge, uh, but I think thinking through the problem and, and developing a measurement plan in a study that recognizes the possibility of unexpected phenomena that ideally would be taken into account in the study design. And again, the paper would ideally provide guidance. And then the last point that I hope uh, uh, Martin and colleagues can address and, and provide guidance in is how do we allocate limited measurement resources? Uh, the four quadrants of the table, uh, other parts of the presentation, and I'm sure the tables in the final paper, uh, will have very lengthy lists of measures uh, that ideally would be used uh, unless things change dramatically uh, at the end of the federal budget uh, or within NCI, we're not likely to be funded uh, to operationalize even a portion of the idealized, uh, idealized measurement plan. So uh, providing some guidance and deciding how to allocate the resources I think would be a useful contribution. Let me move then to the first paper and again begin with the uh, question, what is distinctive about multi-level interventions in healthcare vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis simulation approaches and computer simulation modeling? Uh, my first comment has to do with the, uh, the focus on the beneath the skin or below the skin versus above the skin uh, uh, aspects or levels. Uh, and, and here to me the key distinction is between those aspects that are well understood and predictable, in other words the sorts of phenomena that our clinical research colleagues uh, have the pleasure of studying and dealing with because life for them is easy, uh, versus those that are much more, poor, much more poorly understood, uh, more highly variable and heterogeneous, emergent complex. Uh, my understanding and reading of the four models in the paper is is that uh, models one and four do begin to address uh, the higher levels where things are more interesting and more complicated, whereas two and three, at least to me, seem a little bit less interesting and don't offer that much value for uh, understanding multi-level interventions in healthcare delivery. Uh, so, so my hope would be to see more discussion of models one and four and more elaboration of how they offer guidance in uh, beginning to use computer simulation modeling to understand multi-level phenomena. Uh, there's also the possibility, I presu presume, and it's a good 25 years since uh, my undergraduate degree, which was in uh, uh, operations research, uh, so I had at least some background uh, uh, exposure to computer simulation modeling. But uh, the question is, is whether linked models and other approaches might be used when we are cutting across levels where we have some more predictable, where some of the simpler approaches uh, are likely to be uh, useful. Uh, and, and we're combining those with um, higher levels uh, where things are more interesting, uh, more variable, and more unpredictable, and that that might offer a, a, some, uh, a way forward. Uh, I would hope also that the uh, uh, revised version of the paper, uh, or in future work, uh, a follow-on paper perhaps, uh, that the authors would provide guidance in addressing the sta standard concerns uh, that we all uh, have with simulation approaches, and uh, this is addressed in the paper to some extent. First of all, where do we go for uh, data to uh, parameterize the models? Uh, where do we go to find uh, uh, knowledge and insights into the causal uh, processes and mechanisms that we are trying to model? Uh, I think providing more guidance and more uh, assistance and a leg up or push forward uh, uh, to those who are interested in diving into simulation modeling uh, so that uh, you offer some guidance in answering the questions that you raise in the paper. Uh, uh, and then on the, the uh, issue of model validation, how do we convince our fellow researchers and grant reviewers, but also, as the authors indicate, uh, patients, uh, clinicians, and others, that these models are valid and that the predictions of the models can be trusted? Uh, I don't know to what extent uh, uh, ideas such as split sample strategies uh, work in this field, uh, where you would take half the sample and develop and parameterize the model, and then you test it against the second half of the sample and test the predictions. Uh, if the natural variation that we see in the ways that states have approached uh, a tobacco control using settlement money, if that offers some ability to develop a model on the basis of several states and then use it to predict what happened in other states and use that sort of retrospective approach for validating. But again, I think some uh, uh, additional guidance in the paper on the issue of validation would be helpful to those who uh, hopefully will um, uh, take up the call and, and begin to think about using simulation modeling in this field. Uh, and I would also hope that the authors could um, highlight some of the other advantages uh, of simulation modeling. Um, uh, in the issue of, uh, on the issue of model parameters and knowledge of causal processes, one of the nice things about being forced to uh, develop a simulation model is uh, it's not very easy to hand wave. You actually need to develop code and you need to specify explicitly certain aspects of the process that you're studying. 
that causes you to, uh, or, or allows you to identify clear knowledge gaps, gaps in the available uh, evidence and data, as well as gaps in our knowledge of causal processes. So uh, this I would see as a major uh, benefit and output of simulation modeling that uh, ideally would be highlighted. Uh, and finally, on the issue of interactions and emergent patterns, uh, as uh, the authors indicate, uh, simulation modeling does allow us in a much uh, more feasible manner than empirical study to uh, begin to uh, explore the emergent patterns, the synergies, the interactions. Uh, and um, uh, the next step in the process, ideally, would be to uh, seek empirical evidence of those predictive phenomena and, again, show the value of, of simulation modeling. Uh, and this, too, is an area where I think simulation offers uh, a value and where the authors uh, point out that value, uh, but I think could be highlighted and strengthened in the paper as a way of uh, uh, further showing the, the value and the, the many positive aspects of this paper. Uh, so uh, one final uh, slide and a couple of uh, very minor uh, suggestions to the authors. Uh, each of the four models has a very brief paragraph uh, that's entitled, How Can the Model Be Extended? Uh, uh, I would hope that the authors could provide more and more explicit guidance uh, in how to extend it. Um, I think in the case of Model 4, for example, um, they offer some suggestions for using the disparities model uh, to better understand disparities. There's a large literature on various hypothesized causes of disparities, uh, addressing uh, differences in patient knowledge and beliefs, uh, values, uh, cultural values, and so on, uh, resources available to them, as well as uh, hypothesized causes related to differences in physician knowledge and beliefs, uh, uh, unintended or unknowable decision biases, uh, differences in community resources, I think extending the discussion and pointing out ways in which simulation modeling could be used to uh, take into account all of these hypothesized causes and simulate the effect of providing increased physician uh, uh, knowledge or providing some sort of decision support that would overcome some of the decision biases. These are the kinds of problems and questions I think that simulation modeling would be ideal for and providing more explicit guidance and illustrations uh, would, would increase the value of the paper. And then finally, uh, I'm uh, personally not very knowledgeable uh, about, but very interested in Archimedes and to the extent that it is a prime example of this kind of modeling uh, and has been used uh, uh, with some success, I think expanding the description as a way of allowing those of us who either have 20-year-old uh, knowledge of simulation or have uh, even less knowledge of simulation to better understand what it's all about and, and what it can do for us. Uh, I think using the Archimedes model as a, um, a case study uh, would be helpful. Uh, and with that, I will stop.